Oh, never mind. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome <laughs> to our session here on achieving equality in soccer. My name is Ben Jacobs from B in Sports and ESPN, and we've got an illustrious panel. We'll be focusing on gender equality in sport, specifically oh, okay. men versus women, but also touching upon some other topics, including pride and also aspects of racism as well. Don't forget to hashtag the panel, and if you do have any questions, there'll be time at the end as well. And the good news is following this and the eSports session, there's a happy hour here at the venue as well. And for those of you that are still standing, you can then go to the Intercontinental Hotel as well, where there's a second happy hour. I think I'll be passed out, though, after the first one. <laughs> Let's introduce you to our panel. We've got Aguchi and Laurie, both former national team players for the US men's and women's soccer teams, respectively. We've got Amanda van der Voort, who is the VP of Fan Engagement at MLS. And we've got Anna <laughs> Cathy Hernandez, who is from <laughs> Unit. Vision. So we'll be touching upon a number of topics, and like I say, do feel free to get involved. Your questions are very much welcome. Laurie Lindsay, let's start with oh, you. Great. Welcome. <laughs> Thank a you. very simple question, first of yep. all. Leveling the playing field, how can it be done, and are we moving in the right direction? Ooh, simple. It's just a big, short, <laughs> simple question to begin with. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> are we moving in the right direction? Um, I think in some areas, for sure. I think um, expanding the World Cup and the number of teams in 2015 is massive, whether some people agree with that or not. I think we're still looking at um, our Women's World Cup final next summer is in direct competition with two other uh, major men's sporting events. So if you have to look at that in terms of FIFA putting two men's games at the same time, then that doesn't really look like the the direction that we want to go, us playing in, on turf in 2015, um, not much publicity at the World Cup this summer in terms of promotion of the Women's um, World Cup next summer. So in some regards, I would say, no, we're not actually moving in the, the best direction or the most positive direction that we could be. But I think if you look at um, individual players um, as a whole, um, different players ste stepping up in terms of their federation and their country, I would, I think so as well. People having more, women having more of a voice in their particular country. And Amanda, following on from that, again, just a broad question to begin with. What do you think is needed to try and level a playing field? Is it more representation of women at grassroots level right through to boardrooms? Is it more funding? Is it more opportunity? Is it more respect? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think we have a great opportunity today, and, and I'm excited to be here on, on this panel with everyone to talk about this idea of equality in football and in soccer and, and how we can raise awareness uh, about women and girls in the game, how we can drive access and opportunity for those people to participate, and then how we can think about sustainability um, of, of the girls' game and also women in the game um, achieving both their ambitions, but also driving, driving organizations forward. Because we know that having girls and women involved in football will both, um, in soccer, will both um, create a, a, a more dynamic, more uh, competitive and, and inclusive environment where, where positive and constructive decisions can be made in senior levels and boardrooms. Um, and then also um, community programs where girls can get involved uh, and, and achieve their dreams. Aguchi, well, sorry, go ahead, Laurie. Well, I would, sorry, I just take over already. But <laughs> the one thing I was going to add is, if you're, <laughs> see, Aguchi, <laughs> um, is along those lines in terms of women being involved in like leadership roles. That's what's exciting about the for the 2026 World Cup. It's the first time that we've had a human rights um, section in the bid, and that mandates that there's going to has to be 30 percent women involved in the leadership roles from like top down. So there is some ex exciting things um, ahead in terms of 30 percent women and yep. then 50 percent diverse yep, diversity exactly. in the staff um, in the leadership of of the United um, um, program, the staff as they move forward. And what's interesting, so we know that there's now been a woman hired as the head of the Premier League in England, right? Yep. Um, and an interesting thing that people might not know about her hiring was that the agency who put her forward as one of the candidates had committed to an organization in, in England called Women in Football, had committed that they would put 30% women forward, um, or 30% of their candidate pool would be female for, for any role that came to them in football. As a result, 
she was put forward, then she proved herself as the right candidate for them into the future. But that's because of the commitment that was made by that search by that search firm to put diverse candidates forward. So as we're talking about making progress collectively as a group and all of us who are here thinking about how do we progress the women's game or women in football or girls in, in football, thinking about putting them, creating the opportunity for them uh, to achieve some of these roles is the beginning. It's the first step. And we have to make commitments yep. as we've done and, in the United Bid. Yeah, and we saw during the last World Cup in Russia 2018, Tia Eva, Aunt Eva, she was uh, one of the main uh, uh, persons to Croatia to do, the, to do this uh, second place in the World Cup. She, she was working pretty close to the, to the national team of, Cro of Croatia. They uh, always talk about Aunt Eva. So I think that uh, shows that um, women are very important in every sport and, of course, in soccer that most of the times has been related to men than women. But women has... Uh, have a voice and, and everyone shows that, that that's important if you want to develop the, the sport as a very equal part, you know. I know I Gucci, <laughs> you're finally going to get a say. <laughs> We're talking obviously about promoting women, giving them a voice, giving them equality, so it's only fitting that the men say as little as possible. Um, if they want to just gang up on me, that's fine too. <laughs> no, I, don't, no, I, don't, no. I don't mind. Now, the U.S. women's national team is record-wise, statistically speaking, considerably better than the men's national team. I say that, and the proof is happening now, because England are beating America wow. by two goals to nil. Just so I guess I get, I'm getting like it from all angles right that. now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but what are your experiences there for? Because obviously, as a male national team player, you will have had some funding, you will have earned a good wage, you'll have benefited from USA 94, the current crop of players are going to benefit from the World Cup in 2026. How do you feel, as a male international, you can complement and help the cause of the female internationals who are winning things and are a dominant force in their field? All right. So you're 100% correct. And the women have historically been better than the men in terms of records. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't reflect the, um, I guess, the attendance or the influence in the culture. And uh, I think one of the big reasons for that is misinformation and misunderstanding. I think a lot of people kind of take it for granted what the importance of the women's game have given to this country. Uh, definitely the 94 World Cup was a big boost for the country. I remember I was young, I, I was like 14 years old, watching the men's team play and you know, I was looking at it and I said, okay, you know, soccer is coming to this world, this is something that I, I could do in this country. But just as important was the 1999 World Cup where the women won and I remember I was 17 years old and I saw the passion from Brandy Chastain when she scored that penalty, and I was like, wow, this is, and I, I, you look around the, the stadium and you see that everybody's behind it, and then for whatever reason, it just doesn't translate past that tournament. Um, and that's what we have to educate our country, educate the fans to, to support the women's game just as much as they support the men's game, because it's, it's a critical, critical effort for the whole federation as a whole. And Laurie, just following on from that, did the major tournaments that you were part of and the success of the US team have any kind of tangible legacy after the celebrations? Did you notice a spike in funding or support or did things just return back to normal? And if so, why? Well, I think um, Gucci is right up in, uh, from 99 to even uh, multiple World Cup or Olympics after that, we would have ebbs and flows. It would be excitement around the World Championship and then it would die down. Excitement, and that was proven with like two um, iterations of our pro league that unfortunately failed after three years. But I, I like to say that the 2011 in Germany was um, really put women's soccer on the map because prior to leaving for Germany in 2011, we played at Red Bull Arena in front of, in front of only about 5,000 fans against Mexico, and it was just like, no one really knew, no one even knew that we were headed to the World Cup, really, and then um, we're in Germany, Germany put on this amazing World Cup, and from then, it was kind of like the perfect storm, I think baseball was on strike, the NBA had just finished, and we went into penalty kicks, but double overtime with um, Brazil, where Abby Wambach scored that late goal off of that wild cross from Megan Rapino, and it was like, blew up women's soccer. And since then, since we came back, we ended up losing in the final to Japan. But since that World Cup, we haven't played in fewer than 15 to 20,000 fans 
um, on U.S. soil. And um, it has really put women's soccer um, on the map in, in terms of our national team, right? And so um, it's a little bit of a different story when it comes to our league and how that translates to getting fans um, in the seats for each of our uh, cities in our, in our NWSL, our Women's Pro League. Um, but in terms of fan engagement with our national team, that really set the precedence. And now it's just about, and since then, we've had an even bigger platform <laughs> to talk about um, pay to pl like pay and equality with the men and what that looks like and having a platform which I felt like has really expanded to other federations, other countries. Um, we've seen that with Australia stepping up to their federation. We saw Norway, um, their federation stepping forward and their men coming um, to bat with their women for equal play. So it's starting to spread. And I think that's where the media has a very important like role, you know, to develop all this, uh, about showing all this news, because over the 100% that we, that we see on TV, just 5% are related to sport, to women's sports. So I think that's a huge responsibility of, or, of the media to show all the, the results that they get. And for example, in Univision, we are now broadcasting most of the national women uh, games of, of the soccer national team. And I think that can help to show people that women are playing soccer, that women are related to soccer in a success way. And I think that's one of the responsibilities about media, to show people, because people watch media, even social media, TV, radio, to know that they are success as well. And uh, like four years ago, the, the soccer, the, the national soccer team of, of the United States won the, the World Cup, and those stuffs can make help to change all this uh, mentality about the, the equal facts. I, I think you're 100% correct, and in, in regards to the media, it's, it's the aspect of education. So if you look at the whole general whole of America, we're a young country in regards to our football or soccer knowledge. And so it's about educating the people, the viewers, about the importance of watching the game, educating them about how the game's played, the rules, you know, I mean, A through Z. And I think we're obviously in terms of progression and in terms of just any kind of progression in sports, there's more now than there was five years ago, 10 years ago, sure. but there has to be more effort in, in regards to the ultimate education of the viewer and educating of the fan that you want to attract. So if we break it down into a bit more detail, because often when we discuss gender equality, everyone says the right things, but I'm as interested in doing the right things and as you've already alluded to Amanda that entails employing the right amount of qualified women and putting them in decision making positions such as yours VP of fan engagement such as a chief executive of the Premier League and also to Anna as well senior figures within the media so I want to get both of your thoughts on the specifics of not just how we can create equality, but logistically within your infrastructures, mm. like MLS or senior positions within football or like the media, we can actually change the demographic behind the scenes because that's one of the solutions. If we have a more reflective demographic in boardrooms, in media, in football clubs, that will naturally lead to positive change and equality. Well, I'll start. I'll start with um, a bit of my own, a bit of my own journey, because I started doing social media uh, maybe eight, ten years ago when I was working in women's professional soccer, the second league here in the United States. Because I, I saw an opportunity, actually, to to take consumption of women's sports and put it into the hands of the fans and say, what is it that that drives people to to tune in, turn on, and turn up? for the game, um, when it's a, a female playing or, or when it's a male playing. And, and I thought that using social media could be a really impactful way for both players to tell their stories and also um, for, for companies to, or for, for a sports league, women's professional soccer today, NWSL, well, WPS then, NWSL now, um, to, to tell the story and, and drive engagement. So when I came to Major League Soccer in, in 2010, when I came over, I said, it's hard for me to leave the women's game, but I'm really excited to be part of the men's game, both driving the fandom and awareness um, in the men's game uh, of, 
of women of the men's game, but also how can we leverage this platform in men's football to help spearhead the women's game as well? So we've done things in Major League Soccer, uh, like covering the Women's World Cup on our social media, um, encouraging the women's players uh, in NWSL championships, for example, or celebrating the successes of women in the women's game because we knew we had a, a larger kind of ecosystem to share that message. So that was driven by largely by, by people in the office like me who believe that, that, that women's, um, women's sport deserves that, that equal coverage, right? And, it, and it's, it's, not a, it, it's a battle you fight to, to get the content pushed through some of those channels. But in the end, you know what we found is that fans respond equally to the women's content as they do the men's content. And in fact, a significant amount of my work at MLS now revolves around what is it that drives fandom? What are the things that fans care about in sport? And it's not necessarily female-focused or, or, or male-focused, but it's actually about building this connection with the consumer, hearts and minds of fans. How do we win those hearts and minds of fans? So those are the things that I'm thinking about as an executive in sport. How can I... Um, how can I lean into this idea of, of, of driving hearts and minds around women's football, around diversity and inclusion of football, um, and, and the value that it brings to our sport and, and to the community? Now, I will say there was a woman in my, in my life named Charlotte Moran, who years ago, um, about 15 years ago, she pulled me aside, and she, she said, you know what, Amanda, and I was coaching at the time at New York University. She said, you know what, Amanda? She said, change happens in the boardroom. And I know you believe in that. She said, so I want you to be on this women's committee. I want you to go around. I want you to capture email addresses and, and start building a newsletter. And I took it really seriously. And from then, I said, you know what? My next step is leadership on the board of directors for this association, the NSCAA at the time, our soccer coaches association. And then I said, the next step is to become president of this association. So not only do we need those people to open the doors and say, you know what? You can, you can step through it but then our own courage and passion to believe in the cause so much that we're willing to put ourselves out there to step into it. And Anna, what are some of the challenges you feel you face being a female reporter and presenter within the media? And are things moving in the right direction and away from this disgusting stigma of just men play football, you're a woman, what yeah. do you know about football? Which we know is ridiculous, but has riddled many professional sports for many decades. I think the, the hardest thing is when, uh, when you say, uh, when, when you are talking about uh, soccer or about uh, something specific on sports, do the people trust on your word? What, what you are saying is as uh, true as a man can, can say, you know, like I think that's the hardest to, to make this compatibility with, with people about your knowledge, about what you knew, uh, about what you are developing in, uh, like in your performance. And that's what I came through, through what she was saying about, like, you have to believe that someone can do it. And I remember when I was a little that I saw Mia Hamm, and then I saw A.B. Wombach. And I said, oh, I want to be like them. No? And then you find out, like, because I'm Mexican, and in Mexico it's not as, as developed as here, the soccer. I, I said, oh, I might can do something for, for women on media. And then I came to Univision, I knocked the door, and I found amazing uh, people around that can help you to develop all the, all can you do on, on, on media. And they trust. And uh, last summer, I did the first broadcasted um, uh, uh, game on TV a women, that three women did, and it was the final on, uh, on Russia 2018. And that was the first time that three girls that had the dream one day, came into the on TV and broadcasted alive uh, the final, and that and I think that can make some changes on uh, on what I do, on what all we do, and that people know that women are uh, ready to take a, like a huge role on soccer and on sports. Doesn't matter if it's behind the scene or in the scene. And Gooch, we've spoken a bit about the logistical side and how we can get more women into senior positions. What about the grassroots? You've got a gym. It might not be football, but again, it's grassroots. And Laurie will speak about your involvement and Amanda to an equal playing field in a moment as well. But the other solution is to tackle this problem with young kids in schools, attending your gym, playing football, and realizing that there's a place on the football field or in any sport for both sexes. 
100%. So a few years ago, I, I started a company called Onyx Elite uh, based in Richmond, and we're a sports performance general fitness company. And we train individuals of all fitness levels, kids of all ages and fitness levels. And what you see is there's an overwhelmingly desire of the girls and the females to want to be better. And for me, as a business owner, seeing that now from a different perspective than as a player, it, it's, it's heartwarming because you don't understand that side of the game because I'm not a woman and I just, I'm not in the women's locker room or anything like that. And to, to touch on what Anna was saying earlier is we have to get over that stigma that there's no validity in female sports and there's a lot of it and it's substantial and it's important. And if you see the, the desire from these little girls that grow up to be lovely ladies like this that are important in the game at all different levels, whether it be executive or playing or on the media, you know, you want to pay more attention to it and, and develop the next generation to not have those limitations in their head because they don't have that physical limitation. They can do whatever they want. And, and these, these women here are proof. So what we have to do is start educating the grassroots, as you said, to, to kind of break those barriers and believe that there are no limitations and that you can achieve this and it will happen and it won't stop you just because you're not a boy. You know, I think that's, that's an important and, fact. And I think you have to prepare yourself as well. You know, like mm. if you wanna show up and tell, oh, I know like everyone else, you have to prepare yourself. If you're training, if like me, if, if I have to watch soccer a lot, of, a lot of times, if I have to read, if I have to learn about how social media is growing, uh, I think that that's the most important thing, to be prepared once you get on the, on the scenario, on the show. You know, this, the topic is achieving equality in soccer, and I think we're, 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 we're touching on something here uh, that's really important, and that's the leadership pipeline. So how are we developing leaders within our, within our sport, within our organizations, and thinking not about the leader tomorrow, but about the next leader to come beyond that? And how are we identifying people, opening those doors, and helping them with the tools, the education, and what they need in order when they step through that door, they have the support around them, but they have um, the insight and the information and the connections and network around them as well so that they can be successful. All too often, we put people into these roles in some of these positions, and they don't have the support network, the systems around them. And I think, I think as we're talking about how do we achieve equality in soccer, thinking about who the next leaders are going to be is, inc is incredibly important. One example I'll share, when I was the president of the NSCIA at the time, now the United Soccer Coaches, soccer coaches organization here in the United States of 30,000 members. Um, what we did is we restructured our governance. So we went from a constituent-based governance structure <clears throat> where we had a black coach represented, a Latin coach represented, a woman's coach represented. And we said, you know what? Let's shift our leadership structure so that we're actually elected at large by the membership, but create a leadership tree that can serve into the board of directors so that there's diversity in leadership. As a result, I was the fifth female president in 75 years of the association. Now there are three directly in line after me for the next six years, and that's not by mistake, that's by design. And Laurie and also Amanda, I wanna talk on the grassroots level you touched upon, not just looking at the next leader, but the one after that. And part of that in many yeah. regions is also changing culture. Sometimes when we look at sport and equality, we either focus too much on the elite only, or we look at the Western region. And Laurie, you were part of Equal Playing Field, as was Amanda. And Equal Playing Field, for those of you that don't know, is a sports NGO that has broken two world records, the highest altitude match on Kilimanjaro, the lowest altitude match in support in Jordan with Prince Ali bin Al Hussein, who's kindly backed and built a $2 million football field for us at the Dead Sea to break that world record. And both events had clinics for young children. Both events went into new cultures where girls don't even realize that they can necessarily play sports. So uh, perhaps you could both just elaborate a bit more on what an organization like Equal Playing Field and also AFDP Global, which is another Prince Ali initiative, do and how they help balance equality in sport in cultures that a lot of people don't even consider or know about? Well, you want to start? <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> um, well, I think I was involved in the, a year ago, summer equal playing field. We climbed Kilimanjaro and then played in the highest elevation soccer match um, ever played, um, male or female. And um, 
and really it was based on the premise that it was metaphorically like we're, we're climbing a mountain for uh, gender equality. And what that was, even though we didn't do any direct afterwards that I didn't actually partake in, um, there were some clinics, but what that allowed, at least for me, was to hear shared experiences from people all over the globe, and some played with national teams, some didn't, some played with local clubs, and it was just to hear everyone's experience and how we can take those shared experiences and then directly affect the communities that we're in, um, especially with like young girls playing, playing football. So. I don't know if you want to expand on that a little bit. But. I would. I so so Mount Kilimanjaro was 2017. Yeah, and yeah. then uh, 2018 was the lowest elevation game at, at the Dead Sea in Jordan. And uh, thanks to to Prince Ali here uh, and and his initiative AFDP, um, we were able to to host this game at the lowest elevation. And and what what Prince Ali and and um, kind of the the organizing group that was involved in putting this on uh, really um, really wanted to think about was how do we drive uh, awareness, access, and opportunity for girls throughout the game, and how do we use football as a tool for education, for uniting, for building and developing communities around the world, so, well, in that region, and so what we've done with AFDP now, after having done the, the, the game in Jordan, is now Prince Ali has taken his initiative global to say what is it that we can, we can do to, to use football to help build, drive, unite, and connect communities through the sport um, and, and create this access and opportunity and awareness, by the way, um, especially in the sport for, for what football can, for what soccer can do um, for people around the world. And I just want to wrap things up by talking about some other aspects of inequality as well. It's natural that the focus of this session is on giving females more opportunity in football. But of course, Gooch, there's all kinds of inequality in football, in sport. Another one that I'd like to ask you about is racism, something that you encountered in your playing days. Where are we at as <laughs> regards more acceptance of culture, of religion, of skin color, anything that you've encountered personally? Well, um, the, the sad fact is that racism still exists. Um, uh, but the, the good fact is that nobody's born racist. Um, and that's one of the reasons I'm an ambassador for Football for Peace is because they use football as a, as a vehicle to kind of drive away the divisiveness of cultural differences, of religious differences, of, of all these other differences from people from all other uh, walks of life. I know I've experienced racism uh, in soccer, I've been called multiple names on the field by players, by fans, had things thrown at me. Um, unfortunately, the only way that that can change is by information, because at the end of the day, it's misinformation leads to misunderstanding. Misunderstanding leads to mistrust. Mistrust leads to the anger, the hate, the aggression, and all that. So you have to kind of backtrack it, figure out what's the source of it, what's the cause of it, and ultimately, it all comes down to education. You have to educate your children. You have to educate your family. You have to educate your friends. And sometimes you have to educate yourself. And once all that is done in, in the right structure, in the right manner, then we can work towards tackling the bigger issue of racism. And Laurie, a word on pride as well. You've done a variety of things to promote various athletes of different sexual orientations. And some might even say that within female sports, it's a bit more accepted to come out than it is in male sports, but again, there's still a stigma. What have you encountered? And again, same question to Gooch, are we moving in the right direction? Yeah, I mean, I think um, there is still a stigma. I mean, obviously there's fear when you have basically one professional male player um, in all of Major League Soccer that's out, right? Just one player. So obviously there's still fear around coming out, um, feeling accepted. Um, Yes, I mean, one could argue that there is more acceptance on the women's side, but still, there's, it's fearful in that regard as well, too. But I think it's just important, it's like about having these conversations, right? Whether um, inequality in general, whether it's racism, homophobia, um, gender inequality, because a lot of times with, when you look at Pride in June, when I did um, an event with um, NYCFC, um, a lot of times it's just that one off, right? It's just the month of June where we talk about uh, being the Pride Month, but then what are we doing the other 11 months 
right, um, out of the year? How are we continuing that conversation? And I think that's what we're all talking about here is continuing this conversation, continuing the education of ourselves, of our peers, and um, making sure it's not just these one-off moments. And I think soccer can help to, to change all this, all this image, you know, because we can have, uh, as Messi, uh, we can have Messi, Marta, Modric, a lot of uh, role models that we can see that they learn from uh, some bullying they could have before, like uh, Messi was short, on, he wasn't, you know, so big, and he's one of the best players in the whole world and in, the, in history. Marta came from a favela, and she's one of the best players in the world. So I think soccer can show us that there's a way for every single person in this world to be better and to show our, our best, and media can help, obviously, as well to, to show all those stuff. Great stuff. Well, we're going to have to wrap things up there because there's an eSports panel coming up next, but I'm sure all four of our panel will be willing to take your questions afterwards here and also in the happy hour in the La Liga lounge as well. And <laughs> as I say, we've covered a number of uh, We've covered a number of topics uh, from the grassroots to the logistics to better representation uh, to aspects of pride and racism as well. And we hope that you've enjoyed the um, panel my thanks to all four to my left-hand side and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, Ben.